the fence wouldn't move. An old boyfriend of mine owned a barge once. Dampest relationship I ever had. In every way. The cross looked familiar. I'd seen it before. It was embroidered on the lace cloth I'd picked up at Carchon's apartment. I knew I was on the right track. I tried pushing the fence, but it wouldn't move. A strange pair of locks stopped the latches from releasing the gate. One down, one to go. Nothing like a good convent education for honing your lockpicking skills. For a room full of junk, that was one very sophisticated lock system. This place was definitely fishy. In more ways than one. An old shell case. I wondered what that was doing there.
I'd wrecked the skiff. Not that it was particularly seaworthy anyway. A rough hole was cut into the pillar. Mystery solved. Carchon's stone cylinder slotted into the hole with a satisfying click. The words sinister and dexter were carved on either side. Now any good convent girl like me knows the old Roman for left, right, left, right. But what did it mean here? Rolling out the painted cylinder had given me a print of a secret message. It read, Subjudice. Below it was a sequence of letters, S, D, S, S, D, S, S. A satisfying click told me I turned it to the right position. It felt like tumblers in a safe. Another click, another step closer. I love the sound of locks clicking open. I removed the stone cylinder. Oh my god! The slab came down with a hell of a force. With nothing to hold it up, the cross dropped back down again. If I was going to get a closer look at the panel, I'd have to find a way of keeping the cross up. Lifting the cross closed the entrance door and also opened some kind of stone panel. Ingenious. The stone slab had flattened one end of the shell case. The stone cross was propped up. Now I was getting somewhere. The artifact slotted into the hole perfectly. Behind the old walls, I could hear some kind of mechanism groaning into life. But whatever had been triggered had now jammed. I removed the shell case. The cross didn't drop back down. Some kind of mechanism was holding it up. The gap was too thin for me to get a grip. I needed something thin enough to prise the door open. Another good use for a shell case. Another secret room. Somebody had something to hide. But was it what I was looking for? Wow! 
Through the darkness, I could see that this was a stateroom. But for what purpose? And how did it tie in with Carchon? Amazing! The thing still worked. The room lit up bright as day. Lady Justice stared out from a stone door, which was locked and reinforced with steel bands. A slot next to the safe door. All I had to do was find something to fit into it. It was like being back in kindergarten. All I needed now was a shape that would fit the slot. The flags had faded, but their message was still pretty clear. Fascist regalia, a message of hate. The desks were covered with a layer of dust. No one had worked here for years. Inside the drawer, I found a note written in some kind of code. Don't you just hate it when that happens? The drawer had come out easily enough, but wouldn't fit back into place. A photo, long lost, had fallen down the back of the drawer. It was very old, but there was no mistaking the guy in the foreground. Carchon. Behind him were soldiers, a burning village and a corpse. The photograph was cropped on the right-hand side. Somebody else in the picture obviously didn't want to be in it anymore. I wasn't surprised. This was Africa in the 60s. An uprising was being brutally suppressed. And here was Mr. Media himself. Carchon, doing the suppressing. The photograph was not just powerful evidence. It was also my ticket to one explosive story. But there had to be more for me to discover. It was pretty clear from the lack of dust that someone had been working very recently at this desk. Oh my god! The sheet was a printout with my personal information. Everything from my favorite food to my waist size. They were right about chocolate, but come on guys, I'm a size 10. There was even a picture of me taken with a telephoto lens. Carchon wouldn't have taken these pictures himself. This was big and organized. I was part of it, and people were getting murdered. This was the article I'd written about the costume killer. My suspicions were right. Conchon had cut it out. Two businessmen had been killed. One in Italy, one in Japan. In each case the killer had worn a costume. A penguin, and then a snowman. But that wasn't the only link between the two murders. Both the victims had been big media do-gooders. And I proved they were just the opposite. So, how did they fit in with Carchon? My articles about the costume killer. The dregs at the bottom of the mug hadn't dried out or gone moldy. It wasn't more than a day old. One thing was clear. Someone connected to Carchon had been watching me.
accepted the note. It read, Here. Full report to follow. But this is too urgent to wait. Arno and Yamada both dead. This is not a coincidence. Indeed, it seems that all of us who came together in July are in danger. Take great care. X. I wasn't the only one to make the connection between the costume killer murders. I'd been right all along. That was why he had asked to meet me. But what did I know that he didn't? I had enough for a story. An amazing story that was going to make my reputation and blow Conchance to pieces. I needed to get home fast and start typing. Bonsoir, Coulard. Nico, it's Ronnie. Hey, Ronnie, you cracked open the champagne yet? Are you crazy? What's wrong? Wait a minute. You didn't print it, did you? Of course I didn't print. That's the best piece I've written. The last, as far as I'm concerned. It's important. It's suicidal. You can't destroy a national hero. He deserved it. His corpse isn't even cold. Ronnie, two hours ago I told you what I'd found. You loved it. You begged me to write it up immediately. Two hours is a long time in newspapers, Nico. Someone's got to you, haven't they? Listen up, Nicole, and listen good. Pierre Carchon had a lot of friends, powerful friends. For your own sake. Forget what happened. You got it. End of conversation. Good night. This should have been my big break, but I knew there was nowhere else to sell this story. If Ronnie wouldn't print it, nobody would. Bonsoir, Collard. Mademoiselle Collard, my name is Plantard. I need to talk to you about your story, your Pierre Carchon story. How did you know about that? There are people out there, madame, who will be very upset by this story. Oh, really? Well, it's their lucky day. It's been spiked. Yes, I know. We must meet. We must? I have information relating to your costume killer stories. Tomorrow morning, 8 a.m., Café de la Chandelle Verte. Rue Alain Corps. I shall be wearing a grey overcoat. You must talk to no one about this. You can't tell me what to... Tomorrow at eight. I'll be waiting. People complain about newspaper articles all the time, but not usually before they're printed. I was beginning to feel scared. This guy, Plantard, could I trust him? Should I meet him or forget the whole business? I didn't have an answer. I'd only been in Paris for a week, but already I'd fallen in love with the city. My latest discovery was a little cafe, La Chandelle Verte. I was pretty sure the waitress was taking a shine to me. That old Stobart charm, I guess. Little did I know my reverie was about to be so rudely interrupted. As I picked myself up, I was really angry. One minute I'm on vacation, the next minute some clowns blown me up. I knew right away what I was gonna do. I was gonna find that clown and bring him to justice because justice matters. Justice is up there with liberty and equality and uh, fraternity. After all, that's why I'd studied law, wasn't it? Well, that and the money, of course. <laughs> 